In my first year of law school, in the first week of classes even, I sat with my classmates in the school's common area. We were full of nerves, still trying to figure out who was a friend and who was going to hide the books in the library to try and get a competitive edge. A weary third-year law student spotted us and approached with sage advice. She looked me dead in the eyes and told me to take the money and run. To Paris, to Prague, it didn't matter. She just wanted me to save myself from law school. I love learning, so the advice didn't appeal to me. But 2nd Lieutenant Kevin Firth, staring down the barrel of jump school with the army, decided to do just that, to take the money and run. This is Conduct Unbecoming. I'm Erin, and I'm your host. After two death penalty cases back-to-back, I needed a break from 100-plus page opinions and from the heaviness that comes with covering three senseless murders. So today's case is that little bit of a break. There are a few ways to commission as an officer in the United States Army. You can attend a military academy, graduate, and commission. You can go to another college or university, participate in the Army Reserve Officers Training Corps, ROTC, and use scholarships from the program to make college more attainable and affordable. And if you already have a college degree, you can go to Officer Candidate School. Officer Candidate School, or OCS, is a 14-week course to train people to be Army officers. Some contracts require candidates to complete their service agreement as enlisted soldiers if they fail officer candidate school. So, if this is a route you are considering, please actually read your contract before you sign it. Actually, please just always read a contract before you sign it. Thanks. Commissioning takes a lot of hard work and a lot of land navigation courses. (laughs) The process is rigorous because, quote, an officer is permitted to serve in the army because of the special trust and confidence the president and the nation have placed in the officer's patriotism, valor, fidelity, and competence. An officer is expected to display responsibility commensurate to this special trust and confidence and to act with the highest integrity at all times. Kevin Firth commissioned into the Army as a Signal Corps officer. The Signal Corps is responsible for the Army's communication systems, that's voice, data, and information. Every time we had a problem with the internet in Okinawa, the private company that managed the accounts always blamed the Army Signal Corps, who maintained the fiber optic line. I don't blame the Army for NBC's spotty customer service. After commissioning, 2nd Lieutenant Firth received his first set of orders. These orders required him to report in March 2016 for jump school at Fort Benning, which is now Fort Moore in Georgia. He was further ordered to report to Fort Bragg, now Fort Liberty, in North Carolina in April 2016. Unfortunately, Lieutenant Firth didn't report for duty anywhere. I thought about this case a lot while we were PCSing last month. This was the first time that we made a strictly domestic PCS or permanent change of station, and we were only required to move across the country. After checking out, we had eight days to make our way across the country and check in. This blew my mind. When we were moving to and from Japan, every aspect of our travel was choreographed and required showing orders, medical clearances, orders again, passports, ID cards, and orders a third time. To move across the country, no one needed to be responsible for us. No one wanted receipts for our travel. No one wanted to know where we slept each night or how many hours we drove each day. They just waved goodbye and told us to get to the other side. It was glorious. But the potential downside is that people might just not show up on the other side. 
They might not check in at their new command. So for 2nd Lieutenant Firth, in spite of not arriving or checking in at his new command, every two weeks, 2nd Lieutenant Firth's paycheck auto-deposited into his account, and it kept doing that for the next six months. He received $27,112.13 before his paycheck ceased in or around September 2016. Sometimes I get a little salty about the facts that the appellate opinions choose to include and the ones that they gloss over, and I very much appreciated their close attention to detail in giving me the exact dollar amounts in these opinions. In December 2017, 21 months after he was ordered to report to duty, Lieutenant Firth rolled into the Provost Marshal's office at Fort Liberty and turned himself in. And at the time that he turned himself in, he had just 91 cents left in his bank account. Kevin, if this episode finds its way into your earbuds, please get in touch. I have so many questions. Given assertions made throughout his court-martial and appeal, Firth was mentally responsible and competent the entire time of his absence, and didn't suffer from any mental health diagnosis that affected his ability to act willingly. On Thursday, January 11, 2018, Army lawyers preferred charges against 2nd Lieutenant Firth. He was charged with one specification of desertion, three specifications of being absent without leave, or AWOL, and one specification of larceny of military pay and allowances in excess of $500. Desertion, covered in Article 85 of the Uniform Code of Military Justice, is when a service member leaves or remains absent from their unit, organization, or place of duty without authority, and with the intent to remain away permanently. Changing one's mind and returning to the unit doesn't magically undo the desertion. Showing up two years late doesn't magically undo intending to be permanently absent and is not really an effective defense to desertion. Fifteen days after charges were preferred, on January 26th, Lieutenant Firth submitted a resignation for the good of the service request. This request first went to Lieutenant Firth's chain of command. Every member in the chain of command recommended disapproving the request and taking the matter to general court-martial. After a resignation for the good of the service request has been submitted, the convening authority can either proceed to trial or suspend the proceedings pending the decision on the resignation request. A resignation for the good of the service is available to officers in lieu of a court-martial. The request can be made any time after the charges have been preferred. The officer can actually submit multiple requests to resign if the first is disapproved and they still have time. An officer who submits a request will be retained on active duty until the final disposition of the charges or until the request is approved. If a request for resignation for the good of the service is granted, the officer is separated with an other-than-honorable characterization of service and that means they can't access Veterans Affairs benefits, among other things. Lieutenant Firth's request went to the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army Review Board for consideration, and attached to his request was the Chain of Command's recommendations, a copy of the investigation into his absence and cashing paychecks he didn't actually work for, and a statement signed by the Staff Judge Advocate. On February 20th, the General Court Martial Convening Authority referred the charges against Firth to a general court-martial. Firth's two defense counsel advised him that if his resignation request was approved following the conclusion of the court-martial, the court-martial and any findings would be vacated. And counsel suggested that dilly-dallying on accepting a favorable pre-trial agreement meant Firth would lose all the benefits the government offered and risked more exposure at a contested court-martial. So one month after the charges were referred, on March 21, 2018, Lieutenant Firth submitted an offer to plead guilty. He pled guilty to three specifications of being absent without leave and one specification of wrongful appropriation. 
The sweetheart deal the government offered him capped his confinement at nine months. For those keeping score at home, that would be a full calendar year less than the time Firth was AWOL. Consistent with his plea on April 18, 2018, a judge convicted Lieutenant Firth of absence without leave and wrongful appropriation. The judge sentenced Firth to confinement for three months, a reprimand, and dismissal from the army. But Firth's resignation for the good of the service request was still pending. And five weeks later, on May 22, 2018, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army Review Board approved the resignation for the good of the service and directed the convening authority to vacate any ongoing court-martial proceedings and findings and directed that Firth be administratively discharged with an other-than-honorable characterization of service. The Army issued a DD-214, the separation paperwork, on June 6, 2018. On November 5, 2018, the Army Court of Criminal Appeals issued a decision in the Vance case. In Vance, they reaffirmed that there was no real mechanism by which a secretary could direct a convening authority to vacate a court-martial conviction or sentence due to the 2014 amendments to Article 60 in the UCMJ. So, three months after the Vance decision, on January 10, 2019, the convening authority in Kevin Firth's case approved the findings and sentence imposed by the judge at court-martial. On March 5, 2019, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army Review Board rescinded the approval of the resignation request and voided the separation paperwork. When the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army rescinded acceptance of the resignation request, she had to do so because of a limit on the ability to accept resignations after a court-martial. The full name of a request is a resignation for the good of the service in lieu of general court-martial. If the request is after the general court-martial concludes, it's not really in lieu of anything anymore. The limits weren't necessarily laid out in the most straightforward way, but we'll get to that in a moment. In his appeal to the Court of Appeal for the Armed Forces, Kevin Firth claimed that he received ineffective assistance of counsel. Leading up to his guilty plea, his two defense counsel told him that if his resignation request was approved after he pled guilty, the conviction at court-martial would be vacated. But this advice was not in line with the amendments to Article 60 of the UCMJ. The amendments limited a convening authority's power to dismiss or set aside a finding of guilt or disapprove, commute, or suspend certain parts of sentences in certain circumstances. So it wasn't necessarily that the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army was limited in her authority. It was that the convening authority could not necessarily vacate a conviction at her direction. Ultimately, the advice Firth received was not accurate, and I would offer to you, legal beagles, that this area of law felt a lot squishier then than it does now with the benefit of hindsight. The Army was actively litigating the Vance case while Firth decided whether to accept his plea offer. In his appeals, Firth submitted a declaration that stated, If I had known that pleading guilty would have prevented me from fully benefiting from an approved resignation, I would not have pleaded guilty prior to receiving a decision. In order to win on appeal, Firth had to show that there was prejudice as a result of receiving bad advice. He had to show that if it wasn't for the advice he received, advice that was inconsistent with Article 60, there was a reasonable probability that he would not have pled guilty and, instead, would have insisted on going to trial. It's not enough that Firth stated, after the fact, how he would have pled. The court had to look at all of the evidence to try and back up what Firth asserted as truth. To get at what Firth thought in March 2018, at what factors influenced his decision-making on the plea offer, the judges looked at the terms of the plea deal, the strength of the government's case, possible mitigating circumstances, and how his resignation request was received by his chain of command. 
The plea deal prosecutors offered to Firth was extraordinarily reasonable. The deal dropped the desertion charge and the larceny charge and reduced his possible sentencing exposure. Without the deal, Firth faced a maximum confinement of 12 years. And with the deal, he was capped at just nine months. He was told that if he didn't accept the plea offer in a timely fashion, he would lose at least some of the favorable terms. And Firth's legal team didn't have the ability to stay the court-martial proceedings and stall for time while waiting for the resignation request to be processed. The review board for these resignation requests is not on any kind of hard timetable. When the military judge overseeing the matter heard that Firth submitted a resignation request, the judge planned to proceed with the trial as scheduled, unless or until the deputy assistant secretary of the army told him not to. He was unwilling to pause the proceedings indefinitely on such a straightforward matter. First, appellate team argued that his two court-martial defense counsel were ineffective because they didn't stall the court-martial proceedings and draw them out in hopes that the resignation request approval would come through. And that's easy to say in hindsight, knowing that it took four months to receive a decision. But at the time, Firth's two defense counsel understood that government counsel would not look favorably at efforts to stall. Plea offers get stale when an accused takes too long to accept them. That's the nature of a system that offers plea deals. The terms are more favorable early on to encourage quick acceptance and to close out cases without expending resources unnecessarily. The Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces gave a concerted, genuine, but also kind of vaguely comical effort to explain the strength of the government's case. But there are only so many ways to state that Firth didn't show up for jump school in Georgia, and then he also didn't show up for duty in North Carolina. It's not as if Firth went missing for 12 hours and then came back. Under those circumstances, under a 12-hour departure, it would be far more challenging to show intention to stay away permanently. After 21 months, it would be difficult to argue that he never intended his absence to be permanent. Firth waited until he literally didn't have a full dollar to his name, and he had no other options other than showing up to face the music. When it came to the issue of mitigating circumstances or mitigating factors, there didn't seem to be any. I think that's what made me so curious about what those 21 months away looked like, and what inspired Firth to walk away from the army in the first place. I wish I could know how close he got to reporting for jump school, and what kept him from reporting for duty. The lack of details for those missing 21 months makes the mitigation analysis kind of hard to read because there isn't anything to grasp onto. Whatever happened during those 21 months is a mystery. Whatever prompted this departure is unknown. Firth himself admitted that there were no facts that justified his conduct. And although he was young when he went absent without leave, he was commissioned as an officer and understood the standard he was held to. There is a rich cultural and legal history of holding officers to a higher standard of behavior in the military. The last factor the court considered was how the command viewed this resignation request. Each person in Firth's chain of command recommended disapproving the resignation request, no one he was supposed to work with thought he should be granted a get-out-of-jail-free card. And I know that's an oversimplification, that he'd still have this other-than-honorable classification of service. But he wouldn't have spent any time in confinement, so I think my monopoly comparison stands. The recommendation from the chain of command is significant because it could, at least in some ways, signal how a review board might decide, given all the same facts. It seemed unlikely that the resignation request would be granted. If it seemed unlikely that the resignation request would be granted, that factor should play into Firth's decision to accept the plea deal. In fact, there was no basis for Firth to believe, at the time of his guilty plea, that the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army Review Board routinely disregarded a chain of command's recommendation. 
There was no reason for Firth to believe that the review board would accept his resignation when everyone in his chain of command had recommended disapproving it. And I do get stuck on this point in this case. I get stuck trying to understand why the review board did disregard the chain of command's recommendation. They received the evidence that Kevin Firth never reported for duty. They received the evidence that he received $27,000 for work he didn't perform, and they received the evidence that he spent all of that money before he turned himself in. They knew there was an active court-martial proceeding and how the entire chain of command viewed the request. The decision to waive trial and allow Firth to resign feels incongruous with all that the military does under the guise of maintaining good order and discipline. All in all, the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces did not find that Firth had ineffective assistance of counsel or that he was prejudiced by bad advice, and they upheld his conviction and sentence. I noodled on this for a while and concluded that the Vance opinion had to give more context, context that I was certainly missing in these appellate opinions for Firth. I wanted to understand how two defense counsel whiffed on something that the courts paint as incredibly straightforward. I wanted to understand why the convening authority waited so long to approve the findings and sentence in Firth. It was pretty clear to me when looking at the timeline that the Vance case was pivotal to how Firth's case played out, though it wasn't referenced in the court opinions. So, naturally, I dug into Vance as well. Captain Elmo Vance submitted a resignation for the good of the service request in October 2017. He offered to plead guilty in November 2017. His offer to plead guilty was accepted in December 2017, and he pled guilty to 10 specifications of wrongfully using his government travel card to obtain cash advances, being absent from his unit, and taking convalescent leave for a surgery that didn't happen. He was sentenced to a dismissal and forfeiture of $3,000. Three months after he was sentenced, on March 20, 2018, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army Review Boards accepted Vance's resignation request and directed that his court-martial be vacated. The convening authority for Captain Vance set aside the findings, that's his conviction, and the sentence on March 29, 2018. This was, to put it all back in context, eight days after Lieutenant Kevin Firth submitted his offer to plead, one month before Lieutenant Kevin Firth was convicted and sentenced, and two months before the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army Review Boards approved Kevin Firth's resignation request. But those amendments to Article 60 were still there, and the convening authority could not actually set aside this conviction. Vance and Firth were startlingly similar and happened very close in time. Firth's defense counsel didn't have the benefit of the Army Court of Criminal Appeals' clear and articulate ruling on Vance when they provided Kevin Firth legal advice on his plea offer. The outcome of these matters, that a resignation for the good of the service request approval doesn't trump a conviction, sets up a really interesting tension. Under these circumstances, the right to a speedy trial seems to be in direct conflict with the desire to stall to try and get a resignation approval from the review board. The review board, which seems to approve a lot of resignation requests. And this Tension manifests as almost a race between the prosecutors and the review boards. Whoever acts first wins. I find this fascinating. Prosecutors and convening authorities are far more familiar with a case than a review board could be. But I recognize that letting someone quit their job and just getting them out of the military is a quicker means to an end. But... I find it difficult to argue that the resignation for the good of the service is truly conserving judicial resources because it's only an option after charges are preferred, after the judicial process is rolling and after resources are already invested. 
I think some of this tension could be mitigated by establishing timelines for processing resignations for the good of the service request. But I worry about the effect of an overly permissive resignation request system on military justice. If resignation requests are approved where there are such strong criminal cases against the accused, where's the line? What behavior is bad enough to prosecute, and what should people just be allowed to walk away from? Thank you for listening. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please share it. I invite you to submit case suggestions and feedback to conductunbecomingpod at gmail.com. Join me next time when we dive into bad acts in Florida. Until then, take care. Conduct Unbecoming is a podcast where I get to talk about interesting crimes and cases that involve U.S. military service members. I research, write, and produce the podcast myself. The opinions expressed are my own, and perhaps it's obvious. Conduct Unbecoming is not approved, endorsed, or authorized by the Department of Defense.